Hey, thank you so much, everybody, for showing up today. Um, for those of you who just dropped in, my name is Brett. This is Josh. And uh, we're going to kick off this seven part Good Lawyer startup series with first time founder legal strategies and corporate structures. I'm talking a lot, but I'm going to try to be quiet because we've got the expert with us today to share a lot of his knowledge from, well, I'll let Josh introduce himself in a second. So Katie, let's, uh, let's get cruising. So as I mentioned, this is a seven part series that we're putting together. Um, if you can't make it, you'll see the dates coming up later on another slide, but if you can't make it, we're, all of these are going on YouTube. So um, check it out. If you miss one, no sweat. Coming is always the best option because you can ask your questions and we're here to answer them on the fly. So um, today we're starting off with lesson one, first time founder legal strategies and corporate structures. Next week, we're gonna be dipping into intellectual property and protecting value for your startup. Um, Katie, back please. Yeah, lesson three, um, we're gonna be subbing Josh out and Zach Biggs in, who's our director of public affairs. And we're gonna dig into grant funding for Canadian startups. Zach's gonna be sticking around for lesson four too, where we talk about accelerator programs and we've got a special guest, TAP, the trade accelerator program that's really been helping propel Good Lawyer forward here in Calgary. Uh, they run that through Calgary Economic Development. So we've got an awesome guest um, for that one, lesson four. We're gonna talk about hiring people, the benefits to cash versus equity and how you can leverage some of the unique things about startups to really find great talent like this guy and uh, you know, build your rocket ship. Lesson six, Josh is gonna take a break again. We're gonna bring our head of growth on, Grant Laring, who's gonna talk about growth hacks. And uh, I think we've got a pretty special guest joining us for that as well. And then last but not least, lesson seven, we're gonna wrap up the startup series and talk about how to raise money and uh, some of the practical tips and uh, the legal musts that you should be aware of. Let's keep going, Katie. So today's mission, uh, we're gonna do some quick intros, then I'm gonna hand it over to Josh and he's gonna get into some incorporation basics, why it's so important to get organized right, some of the specific legal documents and strategies that founders need to know. And then we're gonna give you some more tools, which again is gonna be a highlight of those webinars coming down the pipe as we roll through this seven part series. Um, we've got one or two pre-submitted questions and I just wanna remind everybody, if you have a question pre-webinar, get it submitted. There's an easy link on the Eventbrite pages or you can hit any of the folks in the chat and they can direct you. And then we're gonna wrap things up. We've got a very special offer. Uh, if you've been to our webinars lately, you might know what it is. We're gonna be rolling out some different offers as we go through this series. But uh, if you stick around, we love educating entrepreneurs and, and leveling you guys up. So if you, for us, if you're sticking around to the end of the webinar, you're serious about trying to level up as a founder and we've got a little surprise in store for you. Um, let's keep going, Katie. I'm almost done talking, I promise. Um, so I am the startup founder uh, of today's presentation and we got the good lawyer right here. Um, Josh and I, like I said, go way back. We grew up playing soccer together. We went to law school together. We worked at the big firm together. Uh, I dipped out a little bit earlier than you, but uh, he's joined us from the dark side, uh, finally. Yeah. So, uh, Katie, why don't you, uh, yeah, perfect. Josh, why don't you introduce yourself? Perfect. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Brett, for kicking things off. My name's Josh. I joined Good Lawyer in April as the Chief Legal Officer. Um, what that really means, I think we're kind of figuring that out a little bit on the fly. Uh, but in the past, and certainly in this new role, I'm helping uh, the company with sort of all things legal. And I guess, um, why am I qualified to do that? Well, my background is as a, a business lawyer, a corporate securities lawyer for six years before joining Good Lawyer. And um, a lot of the content that I'm going to talk about in today's presentation comes from my experience practicing in a big firm. And it comes from my experience mostly in the big firm where I was working on deals and transactions and financings. And through that experience, I saw lots of mistakes and minefields and uh, uh, routine common errors that founders and great companies made, which actually introduced a lot of deal risk and introduced a lot of extra transaction costs and extra cleanup costs when they were should have been focused on something that was really exciting for the life cycle of their business, like doing a big public offering, raising a bunch of money, selling or buying a key business unit. So we're gonna talk about things uh, to prevent 
those uh, those issues getting in the way of the exciting stuff and the future pathway of your company. Yeah, and and just to, to add on to that, you know, from my perspective, this is stuff that I wish I had known when I started Good Lawyer a few years ago. And like I said, I'm I'm very fortunate to have a guy like Josh inside our team now, and obviously his role extends far beyond just being our corporate lawyer. We are a legal tech business, so coming up with new products and all that kind of stuff also fits very neatly in uh, Josh's chief legal role. Um, but this webinar is totally free. So if you have startup friends, get them out. Like I said, these are going to be on YouTube. People pay 450 bucks an hour for this information when Josh was in his old firm. So um, this is really you know, us trying to democratize legal knowledge, education, and set founders up just like you for success. So a um, couple ground rules for today. Please leave your mics off. Like I said, we love having an interactive webinar. This isn't a, a one direction show. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat, drop them in the Q&A. We've got a ton of folks in there ready to help and direct you if you're looking for something on Good Lawyer. And then finally, as a disclaimer, this presentation, including commentary and audio or text form is provided for information purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal advice. If you want some real advice, check out Good Lawyer. Like I said, we've got some legal concierge guys in the chat and they'd be happy to set you up with a promo code to get started. So let's rock and roll, Katie. Oh, Katie, I think we, uh, we jumped a little bit there. We're a startup too, so we're figuring it out as we go. Here we go. Joshua, take it away. There we go. So um, as Brett kind of highlighted from the start, today we're focused, um, we're going to kind of do more of a high level chat than, than in some of our previous webinars. Um, where we're going to focus our attention is right around uh, the early uh, initial stage of creating your company, the incorporation stage, and a lot of uh, lessons, tips and tricks that go along with that. So you got an idea? Now what? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're starting off here just with some incorporation basics. And uh, for any of you that have done some poking around on the internet and some research around, should I incorporate, should I not? Um, you'll know that there's, there's a few different vehicles that exist in the world of uh, the legal world that you can run your business through. We're focused on corporations and the process of incorporation today because generally speaking, it's the best one. It's the one that's gonna work uh, best for the startup business model. And why is that? Well, there's a few reasons and we'll hit them off here. The first one is protecting yourself from liability. A corporation is a, a, a legal structure that lawmakers came up with that basically says, it's a separate person from you, the founder. And because of that, you the, you, the founder, are not at personally at risk for uh, the debts, liabilities, and obligations of, of the company, of the incorporated entity. So limiting your liability, protecting your personal assets and your house, that is the primary reason why you want to incorporate in the first place. Some other reasons why incorporations are really well suited to the uh, startup life cycle. They're the best and most... Uh, most commonly used vehicles to helping you grow through raising capital and doing financing rounds as you grow. Um, and for startups, those are really the two most important ones. So uh, start with an incorporation. Uh, it's going to protect you from personal liability. It's going to allow you to grow. It's going to allow you to add investors and raise money. And uh, I'm actually, Brett, I'm going to bug you on this one. Uh, I have now in bold on this uh, on this slide here, but why don't you, I think you do a great job actually of distilling what is the time to incorporate? You and I have talked about that before. Totally, yeah. So um, again, Josh, the good lawyer, but from, from my perspective as the entrepreneur, um, there, there is a, it can be too early to incorporate. So if it's just an idea percolating in your head and you're scheming, you know, trying to think about what you might build in the future, you might be a little early for incorporation, um, but as soon as you start going out to the market, either selling to customers, bringing on partners, or you're starting to formulate that idea with other co-founders and you need to start delineating the different roles and responsibilities with other people. So really it's about stakeholders. 
if you're starting, if, if that, I, that great idea in your head is starting to go out into the world and you're bringing other people into it, whether again, it's a customer, a partner, an employee, a co-founder, once you have other people that are starting to interact with your idea and your business, then incorporation is key. And if you're, you know, looking to build something bigger than, you know, a one man shop or a one woman shop in, you know, in your basement, incorporation is almost always going to be the vehicle you want to do that in. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a couple of things that I just want to hit on, uh, because I think, uh, and this focuses around the timing thing. Um, a couple of questions you should ask yourself before you decide to incorporate. Um, think of your name. Think is, is the name that you want to use for your company available? Is the domain name you want to use for your company available? And uh, if, those, if those features are not are, are already used or already uh, out in the market under some, some other business, then you don't want to incorporate under that name and then have to uh, deal with costly reorg and, uh, and negotiations to maybe acquire a, a domain name or something like that. So, so thinking about, do you, can you acquire and can you protect the IP rights around your name and around the domain so you can run your business is a good starting point to think about. And another piece that you have to think about before you jump into the incorporation world is where are you operating your business? Because that will dictate where it most makes sense for you to incorporate. In Canada, we have a structure where you can incorporate federally or you can incorporate in any one of the provinces. Uh, so understanding the jurisdiction where your company is operating is, a, is another important question to ask before you shoot into a registry and get set up. Absolutely. And uh, we got a great point here from Nora in the chat to the panelists and you know, just kind of laying into what I mentioned earlier that it could be too early. And her comment here is about um, being able to write off startup costs. And presumably, I think she's referring to against employment income. So if you've got a startup idea that you're building off the side of your desk while you're working full time and you've got that employment in income and you've got that self income or those, those self the sole proprietor kind of costs, you can break those against each other. But again, once you start bringing other people into the business, into the idea, then it really becomes important that you have a structure, an incorporation to deal with the different rights and limit your liability in case something goes south. Uh, awesome. Roland? Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's jump to the next one. Tara, I see your question here in the Q&A and we will address that. Um, but I'd like to just go through the mechanical process you're now convinced that you're bringing stakeholders to the table. You can protect the name. You know the name that you want to use. The domain's available. You know where you want to run your business. So how do you actually go through the process of incorporating? Uh, the process of incorporating itself is pretty simple. Um, it's really about filling in a standard government document required in whatever jurisdiction you are, uh, you're attempting to create your company in filing that document with the government and paying a government filing fee associated with it. So because that process is so simple, a lot of the nuance and a lot of the risk and a lot of the important additional lessons around incorporations can often get lost. The traditional methods that entrepreneurs and first time founders uh, tend to roll with and even seasoned entrepreneurs roll with uh, for incorporation is a do it yourself, popping into a corporate registry and getting it done. Uh, we will touch on all of the problems with that as we kind of move through the slides here. But uh, the most obvious one is when you work through a registry, you get incorporated, but you don't get organized. And that's really only a fraction of the, of the total pie that you have to worry about when you're, when you're going through this process. Totally. And, and these are things that can be rectified. So if you have already been incorporated through a registry, don't feel like, you know, the game's over. It's certainly not. Um, lawyers, you know, through firms or obviously through good lawyer can rectify those situations, but it starts to get messy. The more people you have involved, the more agreements you need and sign offs you need to make those important changes that will stimulate the future growth. So um, getting organized as early as you can properly 
is really important for a business that's looking to scale. Yeah. So you've got registry on one end of the spectrum, and then you've got law firms on the other end of the spectrum for helping you get incorporated. And uh, with a law firm, you will have the peace of mind of your company is properly created and your company is now properly organized. The problem with law firms, obviously, uh, we're all well aware of this, extremely expensive, really intimidating to approach in the first place. And uh, so oftentimes, this is why entrepreneurs land on the opposite end of the spectrum. The good news is there's some other solutions starting to develop, right? And uh, some are some online solutions. Have you heard of Good Lawyer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you've got some online solutions somewhere in between, not really sure where, the, where they fall on that spectrum. And then you've got the Good Lawyer, uh, the Good Lawyer option. And what we've done is we've tried to kind of take the best parts of the, of the law firm. You're getting legal advice, you're getting properly organized, and we're trying to drive the cost down and make it uh, more foreseeable and accessible to entrepreneurs by leveraging technology. Yeah, and the one thing I'll maybe just add to that is when Josh is referring to a law firm that can get it done right for you, he's talking about a law firm that does corporate and business law. So, you know, just because they're a lawyer, if you've got a family lawyer, you got your will from somebody, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the proper lawyer to set your startup up for success. So if you're gonna go that traditional route again, it's probably going to be a lot more expensive, but make sure you're going with someone that knows what they're doing. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Sounds good. Uh, Katie, let's jump to the next slide here. So flipping ahead in my notes to catch up. Um, I've talked about a little bit on the last slide, the value of going with a, a lawyer and having legal advice involved in this process is they're going to help you get organized, which is really the second and uh, fundamentally important piece to the, to the incorporation process. You create the entity and then you organize the entity. And when you're talking about organization, there's really kind of uh, three themes or three principles that I wanna leave all the entrepreneurs with here today and the startup founders here with, and we'll roll through them in the next slides, but uh, just to hit them off off the top, compliance, which we have here, the next piece is operational efficiency. And the last piece is risk mitigation. And getting organized will feed into all three of those principles, all three of those themes and help you out along the way. So compliance, uh, getting organized is essential because you have a huge number of rules that you have to uh, comply with when you're running a company. And here on the slide, I've hit off a few different areas of law that bring compliance uh, obligations to your doorstep as a business owner. So you have compliance requirements under corporate law that deal with really the, the maintenance of your corporate entity, uh, keeping records, obtaining certain approvals for running your business, providing access to, certain, uh, to records and to certain documentation to stakeholders within your company and having meetings and uh, for your shareholders and your board members and that kind of thing. Uh, there's a whole nother world of uh, legal compliance and rules that you have to follow along with uh, under the banner of securities laws. And uh, I would have brought my Securities Act with me today, but it's so large, I, I don't know if I could lift it to show you on camera. Yeah, you're pretty strong, buddy. Yeah. So we've, the, the world of securities laws deals with every time you are selling shares or selling an ownership interest in your company, you have to deal with and comply with securities laws. So that's where we're talking about things like uh, exemptions, maybe paying filing fees to regulators, that type of thing. You have a world of uh, compliance in employment that we have to be worried about or cognizant of uh, when we're bringing on employees. We're really talking about things like minimum standards for employees around uh, wages, overtime, uh, working conditions, work days, work hours. Uh, we're talking about occupational health and safety standards, those types of things. And then my last bucket here on the slide is everything from privacy, data security, taxes, and really this whole other world of law that your particular business might be operating on based on, um, you know, your your uh, your specific service or product offering might drop you into a regulated world. Totally, and maybe I want to just make it clear here that these other 
issues that can arise, the employment, the privacy, all that kind of stuff, they don't arise because you've incorporated. They arise because of the business you're involved in. And so if you're not incorporated, all of those risks fall onto you personally. And, you know, if it's not an incorporation and you, again, Josh mentioned it, there's, it's like a separate person. It's like this new invisible person that assumes this liability associated with everything related to the business. So if you are getting in trouble for not following employment standards or, you know, privacy breach and you're not incorporated, those risks are back to you personally. And if you have assets like a house, those start to fall into a realm where they could be, they could be seized, they could be taken from you. Yeah. So uh, what I want to communicate here with this compliance slide is getting incorporated is only the first step. Getting your documentation properly organized following creating the entity is important because you have all of these other worlds of compliance and rules that you have to follow. And if you don't start getting organized and keeping good records from the, you know, from the very start, that becomes challenging. So let's jump ahead to the next slide here in our next theme. And we just on one other, just uh, hitting on a question that I saw here in the chat. Uh, I think it might've just gone to a panelist. So you folks might not have seen it, but in terms of costs, you're looking at four to 500 bucks usually in terms of government fees to get incorporated. Um, and then the legal fees on good lawyer are 540 with our service fee. So you're looking at 900 to a thousand bucks generally to incorporate over good lawyer through a registry. You're probably looking a couple hundred dollars cheaper and then through a law firm, you know, I've seen anything from 1500 bucks to thousands of dollars. So, um, if you do go through a law firm, make sure they give you an upfront price. And if they won't, well, you know where to find us. Absolutely. So uh, theme number two, operational efficiency. And this is, uh, I think, one of the uh, positive features that I want to uh, convey to you about why it's important to get organized, because this can improve efficiency and help you run your business uh, smoother, faster, and grow quicker. So one of the key things that uh, I would definitely, definitely highly recommend and think is really essential to hitting off at the very start at the incorporation stage is really figuring out your mount, your management and your founder roles, responsibilities, decision-making powers, obligations. Um, doing that at the, at the outset uh, is, is really important and it will certainly help you navigate how you make decisions and how you run the business um, without you know, before you get into it. So Brett and I can have this conversation at the incorporation phase so that we know that when it comes time to raising money or adding a new team member or entering into a supply contract or whatever it may be, renting new office space, we've already kind of talked about how we're going to manage those decision-making uh, milestones. The next thing uh, around uh, kind of getting organized and keeping good records in connection with the incorporation is that it's gonna allow you and create this uh, habit around standardization so that you know when you're bringing in and negotiating uh, deals, you have this process where you're creating documentation, you're maybe using the same standard documents for uh, customers, suppliers, that kind of thing. And the last thing, when you are very well organized and you've, you've gone through the process of, of setting out these documentation uh, early and creating the, the founder roles and responsibilities, um, you are way, way more agile and way, way more attractive uh, when, it go, when you're going through a fundraising process and we're trying to uh, attract investors and close on those investment rounds. Yeah. And the one thing I'd add to that as well, and we're going to touch on this in greater detail on lesson three when we talk about grant funding, uh, and that's in a couple of weeks, you can't access almost any grant funding for startups, unless you're an incorporated company. So just another, you know, sort of founder tip, if you're looking for those government grants and you're not incorporated, it's going to be an easy no from almost all of the funding agencies that we've come across. So um, just another little perk to, and another reason why you might want to incorporate. Rock and roll. Let's jump to the next one. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so the last theme here, practical risk management. And this is really what, um, 
one another one of the super key features of why you need to sort of get organized and, and take into consideration legal matters as you are at this early stage, this foundational stage of, pardon me, creating your company, and some of the practical risks that you want to think about at this uh, initial incorporation and organizational stage are around uh, founder and shareholder disputes. And this is something that you know I've certainly seen uh, uh, lots of times in my in my practice. Uh, you know, you, you have a situation where you've created a company with a group of founders and uh, you know, the founders have expectations about how much of the pie, how much of the equity that they own. Uh, they may never have actually issued shares. They may never have actually talked about that. Uh, everybody kind of has a different idea of what that looks like. And now you have a dispute among the, the founders and you're fighting over something that you never documented. So uh, that's a really key one. Well, yeah, and this and this practical risk management, and we'll touch on this, I think, a little bit later, uh, extends beyond the incorporation, right? Yes. The incorporation limits your liability as a sole founder or a group of founders, but and they're building out the share structure is also a key piece of that. But in terms of really delineating the roles and responsibilities, and in particular, what happens if one of the co-founders leaves? that's going to get played out in some other documents like the shareholder agreement as well. Yeah, these, these last three slides here, this whole um, theme of getting organized, this is why, um, you know, trying to work through this process all alone as a first time founder without getting um, a legal, uh, legal advice or professionals or advisors involved. Um, really, really challenging to, to kind of navigate and figure this out on your own. And what we're trying to do here is set out uh, compelling reasons why you should um, involve experienced advisors to help you navigate this. So yeah, the compliance piece, uh, running your business more effectively and more efficiently, and here managing your risk. And um, so some other risks that I've certainly seen, and I touched on a little bit in the context of my practice uh, where I was helping raise money and doing deals. And this is the second bullet point on this slide, which is around investor due diligence. So uh, in the context of a major transaction, when you're buying or selling a company or raising a whole bunch of money, the stakeholders involved will want to look under the hood of your business. They're going to want to understand what your documentation looks like, what your business practices look like, what the relationships among the founders are, and who owns the company. And if you haven't thought about this throughout the process and thought about it from the very get-go, there is potentially a lot of uh, landmines or skeletons under that hood when you open it up that introduces real risk to, um, to blowing, potentially blowing up your deal in the worst case scenario. And more commonly, introducing a ton of cost and delay as you fix those matters up to a point where this uh, external stakeholder now feels comfortable to either invest in your company or buy your company or license your, your intellectual property or whatever it may be. Totally. And, you know, just to touch, because uh, Nora dropped that question so everybody could see it in the chat. Um, this comes back to that timing that I was referring to at the very beginning that Josh asked about, which is, is it the right time for me to incorporate? So if you've got some, you know, development costs, you're a solo founder and you're trying to build a website just as an MVP and, you know, you don't have any other important stakeholders yet in the business apart from, you know, perhaps a consultant, um, you know, who's building the website for you. That might make sense to just do as a sole proprietor, not incorporate, assuming you have employment income to write those costs off against uh, on your own personal tax return. And I did that long ago when I ran a painting business before law school. So that does work. But as soon as you start bringing in stakeholders, then in my view, I strongly hold this view that the pros to incorporating will vastly outweigh um, the pros to being able to write those costs off against employment income. Um, again, if you want to raise money from any sort of government institution, or any outside investment investors, you have to be incorporated. And as soon as you start bringing other people onto your rocket ship, it's the best way to limit your personal liability and the best way to structure your business 
so that the pie can be divvied up and the roles and responsibilities delineated properly. So um, again, there's a time and a place to incorporate. And if you're not sure where you're at, highly recommend you bug one of the LC guys, our legal concierge in the chat. They'll get you a free promo code and talk to a lawyer about it because you don't know what you don't know. Well, since we're answering a couple of questions, I'm gonna take this other one now from uh, Tara, which I mentioned before, which is essentially, we've already taken some capital contributions and have not incorporated. Can we just backdate these to when we incorporate? Um, hitting, on, uh, hitting on Brett's point here, and I think this, this really is the, the important theme of the chat. Once you are engaging external stakeholders into your company, into your business idea, whether that's in the form of um, investors or in the form of co-founders or in the form of employees, really, really strongly recommend getting incorporated. There are some things that we can do in the world of corporate law where we can, I don't like using the term backdating because backdating sounds like you're trying to uh, um, pull a trick or something like that. Sometimes what we can do is we can go back and we can memorialize things. So we can say, well, uh, even though we, the, the money landed on this day or the corporate action took place on this date, we really approved it and meant that it happened at this other time. So we can, we can date it to, a, to an earlier time. In the world of incorporation, you can't really do that because the entity gets created on the day the filing fees and the documents go into the government. So you cannot say that an investor put money into your, incorp into your company uh, six months, a year, three months, whatever it may be, before the company is created. So just as a simple one there, um, before you start taking money, before you start engaging with your uh, external stakeholders, talk to a lawyer about getting incorporated. Yeah, is there any ability to transfer or assign any of that once it's been incorporated? Nothing here is fatal. Yeah. Uh, it's really what we're talking about here is managing cleanup costs. And if you are turned off of the idea of incorporating because you don't wanna outlay four or 500 bucks at a corporate registry or a thousand dollars through a, through a, a legal advisor or a platform like good lawyer, you should know that the cleanup costs of going through the, the different corporate steps to whether you want to call it backdating or memorializing, or uh, just finding a way to get that investment now into your corporate entity or to get your IP out of your name personally and into your corporate entity. All of those things have higher transactional costs when you're going and cleaning it up rather than starting clean, starting with an incorporated entity and building that value in that corporate entity for me. Yeah. And I've got like alarm bells going off immediately. If, if an investor's giving me money for my startup idea and I'm putting that into my personal bank account, like that just smells like a disaster waiting to happen. Because, you know, what if I buy groceries? Did the investor give me money to buy groceries? Or, you know, yeah. where is that money supposed to be used? And what are the rights of the investors? So um, if that investor is watching, they should talk to a lawyer because they're investing in a way that does not protect them very well. Um, another interesting question here. Uh, feels like a law school question. Piercing the corporate veil. Um, so the question here, um, someone anonymous is incorporating really necessary? Unless you have multiple shell corporations, wouldn't the courts be able to pierce the corporate veil? I'm gonna respond and then you can probably fill it, fill it in. Yeah. Um, absolutely incorporating is necessary. Piercing the corporate veil is a, a law school concept that does occur very rarely in the world of business. So it is something that can be done if a director or an officer, i.e. the CEO, does something incredibly shady within the corporate structure, the courts can pierce that corporate veil and go after the person directly, but in very rare circumstances versus if the business just doesn't work out and you can't fulfill some of the contracts that you'd signed, that's not going to pierce the corporate veil. Worst case scenario, the company's going to go bankrupt. Personally, nothing's going to happen to you materially. Again, if there's a personal guarantee that's a little bit different, but also far less liability relating to you as an individual than 
if you're running a business as a sole prop. You nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay, let's let's jump to the next slide. We've got a few more questions popping up too, so we'll make sure uh, we hit them all. And I just want to encourage everybody on the webinar, hit us with questions. We've got uh, plenty of time left in a few slides. And like I said, that offer's coming in a minute. Yeah, awesome. So uh, I kind of laid out the, the three foundational principles uh, that I think are great uh, or foundational principles or themes that I think are great arguments for um, getting incorporated and thinking about um, a legal strategy and a legal plan for your business. And just to reiterate, uh, you have a ton of uh, compliance obligations when you're running a business, whether you incorporate or not, you have to comply with the law. Uh, having a legal strategy and getting advisors involved will help you make sure that you are doing that in an efficient way. Number two, you're gonna run your business more efficiently and more effectively by getting uh, good legal advisors at the table. They're gonna help uh, structure and document things in a way that are gonna allow you to do and run your business and hit corporate steps and, and uh, business milestones in a way that doesn't delay you because you're not creating documentation or going back and fixing stuff at the time. And then the last piece is the risk mitigation. Uh, so here on this slide, what I wanna offer are just some uh, common, some common documents that feed into those three principles that I talked about before. And uh, you know, the the overarching theme here is to be proactive and be diligent from the start, right from the day you create your company. Uh, if you attended last time and you hear me say this, tight is right. Tight is right, baby. You got it. So uh, the first one here, your corporate organizational documents. This is the piece that you will not get from the registry. You will only get this if you're dealing with a lawyer. This is your, this is your minute book. These are your uh, corporate organizational records. We're talking about who are your directors? Who are your officers? What are your bylaws? What does your share structure look like? Uh, how many shares are you authorized to issue? Uh, all of that stuff. Okay, uh, the second one, um, and I think this is a really, really important one for anybody that's attending today that is running a, a startup with co-founder or co-founders. If there's a group of you with a fantastic idea and you wanna grow and blow up your startup, um, you should absolutely have number two on the list here, a founder agreement or a shareholders agreement. This is something we talked about before where you're setting out the rights the responsibilities, the decision-making powers of your founder group. And this is gonna help you deal with issues like potential founder exits, potential stalemates in decision-making, um, how to bring on new investors and new shareholders in the company. All of these things you need to think about and talk about early on, and then you wanna get it documented um, in a smooth, clear, professional and easy to understand shareholder agreement. The next one I wanna hit you with here is an employment agreement. And even if you don't have employees in your business, if you have co-founders, you should have employment agreements to start with. And the reason why I think this is so important is because if you're dealing with a founder exit, um, likely all of your founders are employed by the business. So you're going to be left with two issues. You're left with a founder issue um, because your co-founder is an owner in the business. So that's like a shareholder founder issue. And you're left with the second piece, or sorry, the, the founder shareholder issue, which you are mitigating with number two on list, the list here, the shareholder agreement. And then you have an employment issue potentially, which is if Brett and I are co-founders together and Brett exits the company, uh, I've now terminated him from his role as uh, CEO. What I don't want is Brett coming after, after the company for a huge severance, right? For a whole bunch of entitlements under the terms of his uh, executive employment relationship with the company. So we wanna make sure we limit that to uh, the minimum employment standards uh, entitlements. The next one on the list I wanna hit you with is capitalization records. So what I'm talking about here is a, a record, uh, a capitalization table or a record of who the owners 
of the business are. So really, really important. This number four will feed into every round of investment that you ever take into your company. When you're dealing with sophisticated parties, they want to know who are the owners of the business? Who am I joining in this business by putting money in? How much do I, how much ownership am I getting for my five, 10, 50, hundred thousand million dollars that I'm investing into the company? So number four absolutely is a must and something that needs to be continually updated. Dead weight on the cap table kills companies. It, it kills startups for two reasons. Investors don't like it because if there's a bunch of dead weight on the cap uh, on the cap table from a co-founder, you know, who say owns 20, 30% still, and now they're gone. That is a huge issue for investors. And as a founder who's sticking around, um, I mean, we ran into this with good lawyer and we came out the other side pretty unscathed, but as a founder, if you have one of your co-founders leave and they still own a huge piece of the company. And I've seen this with a lot of other startups that we've helped it's demotivating. It's, it's not fair. So having that, those tough conversations up front with your co-founders being honest and, you know, it's kind of like a prenup, but, you know, getting co-founding a company is so similar to getting married and, and it lasts. I think the stat I heard is in California, co-founder relationships are longer than average marriages and uh, getting those, getting everybody on the same page and planning for the worst if someone leaves is going to set you up if that unfortunate circumstance arises, which I can tell you happens way more often than you think it does. Building a startup is not for the, the faint of heart. It takes longer than you think. It's harder than you think it's going to be. And it's not going to be for everybody. So setting your company up and making sure that if someone leaves, the company is not going down with them is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Um, the last piece here that I want to leave you with is just a uh, third party contract. So anytime you are dealing with uh, third parties, whether it's uh, employees, whether it's contractors, whether it's customers or suppliers, uh, you should get into the practice of documenting those relationships with contracts and uh, they're available online, but you have to understand, I guess, the, the importance of these external stakeholders that you're, you're involving. Getting it documented, even with the template, is probably better than nothing. But given that it might be something that's very important or crucial to your company, you should have uh, some advice around what's in that document, understanding the terms, and getting a lawyer to have a, have a look and help you through that process is the best way to do that. You got to understand what you're signing and you got to, you know, be humble enough to realize that you don't know what you don't know. Um, you see a lot of startup founders or do it yourselfers. And I love that, have tremendous respect for that, but it's risky to be signing contracts that are going to impact your business for years to come without actually understanding them. And, you know, that's why lawyers exist, frankly, in the, in the business world. And we're trying to bring them to you more affordably and more accessibly than before, because, we know hiring us at the old firm was painful and uh, hopefully sessions like this, where we can get you a bit ed educated, get you a little bit elevated in terms of your understanding of how the business and the legal pieces play together is really what we're trying to do. Um, next. Yeah, that's it for me. Let's keep rolling through the slides here. There's a ton of questions coming in. So I want to make sure we get to those. Yeah. So quickly going to highlight again, what's coming up on the startup series. Uh, we've got one or two pre-submitted questions. We're going to roll out the offer that I mentioned at the beginning, and then we're just going to spend the last 50 minutes or so answering more questions that are coming in. So if you've got questions on the tip of your brain, um, fire away. Katie, can you just back up real quick? So quickly again, these are all the dates. We'll send this out. Um, if you haven't received it, hit one of the guys in the chat and they can provide you with all this information. But we've got six more episodes coming with this startup series and would love to see you folks out. Um, we're pretty proud of what we put together for this startup series. And today is just like the light dipping into it. So uh, we've got some really great content coming down the pipe. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, I've hit you with a ton of content today. It's all kind of high level. We're not really digging into things. Um, 
I, I hope I haven't freaked you out or scared you too away from uh, trying to follow your dreams in the in the startup world here. That's not the intention. The intention is there's a big world of, of law out there. Uh, creating a startup, there's no way of avoiding the way that your business idea is going to interact with the law. So engaging advisors, attending webinars like this is a great way to start becoming familiar with it. And through the rest of these episodes, especially ones that are legal focused, we're going to dig into uh, a lot more of the detail around it and help you get uh, more educated and, and better and more comfortable at spotting issues and understanding, is this something that is critically important to my business that I should be talking to a professional advisor about? So uh, if you're feeling, if your head is spinning right now, that's okay. Mine is a little bit too. And we're going to get into the detail through the rest of the summer. Be smart, get help. I was a corporate lawyer and I needed help. I need this guy. So, um, you know, recognize when you need help and, and don't be shy to get it. All right, Katie, let's move on to the pre-submitted question. And then I'm going to hit everybody with that offer I mentioned. Just going to drop this for you, Josh. So is there a benefit to incorporate in Canada, especially when most of my customers are in the U.S.? Should I be incorporating in the U.S. instead? Well, I'll hit this uh, with general principles because I'm, I'm not a U.S. lawyer, but, uh, and I'm, I'm not trained in U.S. law, but this goes back to the initial questions that you're asking yourself uh, around, uh, is it time to incorporate? So one of the questions you should be asking yourself are, where is my business going to operate? Where am I going to be drawing, uh, you know, my, where are my co-founders? Where's my potential office going to be? Where are my investors, you know, my network of people that I can, uh, that I can count on to raise my, or to, to grow and, and run my business. And if that's all in Canada, um, just having a customer base in the U.S., in my mind, is probably not a compelling enough reason to step into the U.S. and incorporate and create your company there. The reason you know, the biggest reason to be sort of wary about that is that wherever you decide to incorporate, that is the legal system, the legal compliance regime where you now have to follow. So if you decide to go and incorporate in US, even if you are a Canadian, even if you're sitting here in Calgary, like I am today, you're subject to US law. So, um, you know, I, I would say that if your if your network, your support systems, your co-founders, your potential office, all of that is in Canada. Those are all great reasons to incorporate in a Canadian jurisdiction. Yeah, maybe with the one kicker and the thing that I've seen pop up for startup founders in the past is when they're going to raise a decent, like a sizable check from a U.S. or a, a syndicate of U.S. venture capitalists or angels. So sometimes if you're looking to raise money from U.S. investors, which um, for any of the startup founders on here with global ambitions, highly recommend you try to connect with some of the folks down there. Um, that might be a, a reason where you need to incorporate because they're going to mandate it. If you want this 2 million bucks, you need to be incorporated in Delaware. But again, that is for a specific scenario and there are additional costs basically because you got to be in more compliance with a bunch, bunch of more laws. Yeah, I would say in that particular uh, fact scenario, you'll get there. That's a path that Good Lawyer wants to follow one day. And, you know, we will create uh, a special purpose uh, U.S. subsidiary for the purposes of attracting investment if we need to do that. So uh, you don't need to know all those steps ahead, but that is a, a point well made, Brett. That might be something that an investor or something might ask you to do in your startup journey. Awesome. All right, Katie, time to share our little storyline here. So again, we've touched on it, Nora, thanks for your comments. It has to be the right moment to incorporate and you know, in the most simplest form from my perspective, if you're bringing stakeholders into your party, onto your rocket ship, you should probably be incorporated. And if you wanna get incorporated, we highly recommend you talk to a lawyer because again, to Josh's point, you can check the government regulatory boxes and pay the fees and, and have a company. But as soon as you start bringing in more shareholders, more stakeholders, you really want to make sure that you're organized properly. And that's real, really where the lawyer can come in super handy. So if you need a lawyer, you're looking at the traditional model, billable hours, 
or you're looking at something like Good Lawyer predicated on fixed fee services. And the one that I want to touch on today is our new subscription offering that you, a few of you folks may have seen before, Good Lawyer Pro. And uh, like I said, we've got a special perk on for webinar attendees because we love entrepreneurs that are trying to level up and get smarter about their business. Okay, next. So we got the story of law firm Larry. We could have probably called him law firm Josh not so long ago. Uh, you call Larry at the law firm once a month, just keeping it nice and simple for 15 minutes. 15 minutes in our old world is 0.3. That's what we called it, a 0.3 billable hours. We always round up. 0.3 times 12, we're talking about 3.6 billable hours over the course of a year for 15 minutes a month. That's all I'm talking about is you on the phone with a lawyer for 15 minutes. Um, 3.6 times my old rate, you're getting a surprise bill from law firm Larry for 1440, probably a couple months after you did the work. Doesn't feel great and you know is one of the reasons why so many folks are choosing to do it themselves, whether it's going through a registry, whether they're sticking with templates, um, and that's really what we're trying to change. So good lawyer, next Katie. If you're not familiar with us, we've got a whole pricing list of fixed fee services. Uh, as well as some micro legal services, including our 39 bucks for 15 minutes. So that's like a little sampler. Like I said, if you're brand new to Good Lawyer, hit one of the legal concierge guys in the chat and they'll make sure that your first, first taste of the platform is totally free. Um, but if you're getting serious about your business and you know that you're going to need that legal expertise on an ongoing basis and you want to be able to talk to a lawyer without worrying about a 0.1 or a 0.2 or 0.3, then Good Lawyer Pro is for you. So our regular Good Lawyer Pro comes with unlimited legal advice sessions. This is for the annual, a 7% reduction on the cost of services and our service fee on the platform. So you get some nice discounts and then you get VIP access to our legal concierge team. And I can assure you that we're going to take way better care of you than you've probably ever experienced if you've worked with a law firm before. So that's our regular pro. But like I said, we got something special in store for you. Katie, next slide. Oh, that's a testimonial from one of our awesome pros. We love Phil. He's building something super cool here in Calgary as well. And uh, he's a big fan, as you can tell. Okay, Katie, last one here. 297, this offer is gonna be good until end of day Friday. Like I said, we're doing a seven part series. So we're gonna be throwing in new offers, trying to get startups across Canada leveled up. And this is where it starts. So if, if you're interested in Good Lawyer Pro, again, it comes with that unlimited advice, 7% reduction on, our service fees because you're in our community now that vip legal concierge and just to make it an absolute no-brainer if you're inclined at all um for webinar guests only we're going to do a 30-day money-back guarantee so um if you want to try good lawyer pro out you decide it's not for you i don't think you will but if you do um 30 days we'll refund that no questions asked so with that we're going to touch on a few of the last questions that we've got here from the audience. And like I said, um, we've got another five, 10 minutes. We don't mind sticking over a, a couple minutes. Um, so if you got questions, fire them, fire them away because uh, we love helping founders like you. So Trish, well, that's more of an insurance question. I can just kind of pull on that one. Yeah. So from Trish, when starting up, when and how to add in insurance, how can good lawyer help? Um, Trish has a tech startup and is close to going live and adding users to her platform, which is super exciting. So congratulations, Trish. Um, I mean, we're, we're about providing that legal, legal support, not so much on the insurance side, although good insurance might come down the pipe in, uh, in the future. Um, but we do have some great partners. So if you want to get connected with someone in the insurance space, reach out to one of the guys in the chat, the legal concierge team, and we can connect you with some of the companies that we think share our values, which is helping entrepreneurs and startups succeed. So we can definitely point you in the right direction. And maybe one day we can help you take care of that too. I, I would just hit on that one, one thing, Trish, I think a question like this is, is really great and really suitable for uh, one of our quick advice sessions, because what a lawyer can help you do around this insurance question, uh, they can help you identify different potential risks in your in your business. And that might help you be a bit more informed when you're going in to have the conversation um, with an insurance provider about the type of insurance that you want to acquire for your business. So maybe st it's stuff around your directors and officers, maybe it's operational based on the nature of your business. 
um, that type of thing. So I think that's a that's a good question that a lawyer can help maybe uh, help you chat through risk, identify priorities, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got another question here um, from Nora. Do you provide contracts or just strictly advise for the subscription? Um, we absolutely provide contracts. So if you, maybe one of the LC guys can drop the pricing page into the chat. Um, we do everything that an entrepreneur in Canada could pretty much possibly need from a legal perspective. We've got over 60 phenomenal lawyers right across the country. And that's one of the beauties too. And I touched on it earlier. Going to a lawyer is not enough. You need to go to a lawyer that knows what they're doing and understands startups and ideally understands your industry. So that's one of the things that we're really proud of at Good Lawyer, where we've gotten to is we're able to provide that big firm power, that full service law firm experience with the legal concierge and, you know, a bit of more of a smile on than you might find downtown. But we're able to do it at those low, those small firm prices because all of our lawyers are these independent lawyers across the country and they're entrepreneurs too. They get it. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing I would add to that, uh, when you're engaging with Good Lawyer, you're not getting advice from Brett and I, and, and that's a good thing. You're getting the specialized advice for the questions that you're bringing to the table. Um, we have a network of lawyers right across Canada that have specialized expertise in, in many different areas of law that uh, would be specific to your different journey. So if you needed a patent or a trademark, we have intellectual property specialists that are uh, equipped to deal with that. If you have employment law issues, we have, uh, you know, a whole large number of uh, practitioners on the available through the Good Lawyer platform that know all about labor and employment and employment policies and that type of thing. And then we have, uh, you know, our startup uh, focused and, and corporate focused legal gurus that can uh, help you with all the questions that relate to your business in that world. Totally. And, and Nora, again, appreciate how interactive you've been today. Comparing us to Legal Shield, I love that comparison. I'll take that all on all day because Legal Shield gets you some freebies that you, I mean, you pay for it through the subscription, but it's really just a lead gen for the law firms that they partner with. And once you get connected with the law firm, you know, and you've exhausted the very limited scope of what they'll provide for free, then you're back into traditional law firm, Larry. So um, we don't do that at Good Lawyer. Everything on Good Lawyer is fixed fee upfront. And that's just the way it goes. And we maintain the whole life cycle. So if you have an issue with a lawyer, you come back to us and we make sure we get it resolved. You're leaving reviews. The lawyers are hugely motivated to provide great service because we're making their lives so much easier than ever before. So um, yeah, I, I, I put Good Lawyer Pro up against Legal Shield all day and all night. Um, I can answer this. I perfect. This we got another question here. Yeah, so this is... Uh... An anonymous question here from one of our attendees who's running a, a sole proprietorship business. So that means they're running it just essentially by themselves, running a business for uh, almost two years now and thinking of incorporating. Um, the question is, is there going to, you know, when is the ideal to, to incorporate and are there going to be tax consequences associated with trying to get this uh, solo practitioner business, the independent business they've been running under their own name into a corporate vehicle. Um, there's definitely a way uh, to do that uh, where you can transfer your own personal assets into a corporate vehicle. And there's definitely a way to do it that is tax efficient, it's generally referred to as a, as a rollover transaction. And it's something that um, tax authorities allow to recognize unique circumstances like this where uh, really, it's the same person. You are the the uh, the sole owner of your business now, and presumably would be um, exchanging the value in the business that you're running right now into a corporate entity in exchange for ownership of that corporate entity. And there's a way to do that where you can certainly minimize your uh, your tax obligations. Uh, but really, to dig into that, you're going to have to uh, connect with. Uh, connect with a lawyer and uh, deal with the specific facts around your uh, your particular business. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, we do have the expertise to assist you with that. So um, again, feel free to poke around goodlawyer.ca or just hit one of our legal concierge guys and they can uh, make the connection for you. Um, and that was one thing that we didn't really touch on earlier on 
in today's presentation about the benefits of incorporating the tax consequences. And that's really a function of this specific webinar today being aimed at these early stage founders where the tax issues and the reduced corporate tax rate, but then you get the double taxation, just don't really come into play in those early days. But absolutely, there are some very big benefits from a tax perspective to incorporating and leaving money in the business. If you're trying to build and grow a business, you can leave the profits, retained earnings in the business. They get taxed at a lower rate to fuel the growth of that business faster. Whereas if you're just looking to, you know, if it's more of a lifestyle business, money in, you want to take the money out, um, then you are going to hit, get hit with double taxes. But there are, as Josh has mentioned, very effective ways to do that with the right expertise. And all right, folks, we've got uh, time here for one and maybe two more questions. So um, what do we got here? Tara, so I'll read it out and you can do your best to answer. Sure. We love putting Josh on the spot like this. At least two of our founders are based outside of Canada. Um, one is in Romania and we'll be doing business in Canada, China, and Europe. Do we need to incorporate in those jurisdictions as well? Can we help out with that? Nice, yeah. Um, so well, I'll deal with uh, the first part here. The fact that you may have founders in other jurisdictions, that in itself is not a barrier to incorporating in Canada. Um, there used to be a rule in, um, in many Canadian corporate jurisdictions where you, ne you needed to have at least one Canadian resident as part of your board of directors. Some Canadian jurisdictions are moving away from that requirement. Um, so the fact that some of your founders may be in other jurisdictions, that's not a barrier to incorporating in Canada. If you're in Canada and you're running business here and this is where you want uh, kind of the um, home base to be, still certainly makes sense to incorporate uh, here in Canada. In the other jurisdictions, um, that's hard for me to hit off, off the top of my head. Now, we had a question earlier about selling to customers in, um, in the United States. To me, um, although, you're, although you have customers in a different jurisdiction, you're not totally doing business there. You don't have an office there. You may not have employees there. And so uh, the need to incorporate in that jurisdiction is not obvious to me. Um, in this particular case, if you do have employees that are based in these other jurisdictions, you have offices based in those other jurisdictions, um, in addition to customers and uh, maybe job sites or whatever it may be, those might be um, good reasons to consider having, um, to consider having a, a corporate entity in those jurisdictions. But uh, the age old question or the age old annoying answer from a lawyer, it depends. You're gonna have to get some specific advice around that. Um, so, and for 297, you can have as many advice sessions as you want. There you go. Thanks for bailing yeah. me out on that. Yeah. So thanks so much, folks. That's it for today. We're going to be back next week and the week after that and for the next six weeks um, to level you up as a startup founder. And uh, we'll be back next week with intellectual property and uh, protecting startup value. Let's do it. Awesome. So we like the music that we're rolling with. And then this is going to be a theme. We might be popping in different music, but we're going to end it today with some, uh, some more Toto.